So uh, today we have two really great speakers, two, two good friends, one older and one newer. Uh, the first one is uh, Sidney Moncrief, the first speaker of one hour. Sidney Moncrief, an old friend of mine, and Sidney and I spent time together back to even in Phoenix for a while, uh, and then uh, gotten to do a lot of things over the years since he and I both moved back to Arkansas. And he's just one of the finest human beings I've ever met. Um, he's got a, a really good voice on diversity, inclusion, and equity. I think you'll really enjoy what he has to say. And it's, it's a, something we all want to look at with fresh eyes, I think, uh, all of this. I really think that'd be healthy for all of us. You know, Lord Grisham talks about uh, we're, we, you know, we're developing biases in some way all the time. And we have to be aware of that and, and knock those down. You know, it kind of happens, uh, you know, um, unconsciously so um, you know there's that and uh, just an important topic and, and I'm looking forward to hearing from Sydney Sydney's former great pro uh, athlete but building a personal development firm that's really uh, taken hold and uh, he's been working hard at it just like he did when he was an NBA player and he's a, he's a great asset for all of us and I hope you'll uh, think about how you can uh, include him in some of the things that you do so with that Sydney I'll take it away sir Hey, Tim. Hello, everyone. Tim, you said an older and a new, and I'm just trying to figure out where do I fit in in that uh, scenario. You have yeah. two speakers. Are you saying I'm the older person? Uh, which I would be very you're impressed. You're an old friend. Old friend. Versus, All right. <laughs> yeah. you more years. Well, you know. well, well, good morning, everybody. Hey, Tim, I think what I want to do is just to do a, a little short opening because sometimes you do a tremendous job of asking the right questions. Maybe others might have questions they want to ask. Certainly I'm not, I have no PhD in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Most of mine is based on what I've read, what I understand, and what I lived. And we all have difference of, difference of opinion, but I do want to say this is the most critical issue of our decade. Hands down, I know it's an, it's, a, it's an early decade, but this is very, very critical. And I think earlier in the process, people were on fire, consciousness running high. And, I, and now we're seeing a little bit of deterioration in that. We're seeing a little bit of maybe the fire starting to go out just a little bit. And what, what I want to do is to turn that fire back up in the minds of everyone on this call so we can understand that we can do something, we can do something to help this issue. And I like to say, if you think it's bad, it's worse than what you think. Because we're talking 2020, and so I'm, I'm preparing for a meeting at 11.30, really at 11 o'clock and 11.30, and the meeting is specifically about how can we increase the engagement of minority and women's businesses in the state of Arkansas? And as I was looking through some data and looking through some correspondence, I would have thought I was in the 60s because the reaction to some entities about what they can do and how quickly they can do it is not as aggressive as it needs to be. So I wanna challenge everyone on the call to know that you have value, to know that you're, you're very much appreciated to know and to challenge you, don't get caught up in the rhetoric that you see on TV about Black Lives Matter or white privilege. All that has been so diluted and it's been diluted to the point where it has offended people unnecessarily. All I want us to focus on for the next 20 minutes is that we have value and we can make a change. We can have change in this world to become a better place. And that's what I'm here for. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about the challenge, Tim, and, and everyone. I'm excited about the possibilities. We have a state, a small state. I live in Texas. I live in Arkansas. Arkansas is a small state that we can start to change. I, have, I had a very good friend from Wisconsin, and he called, oh, this must have been back when the first incident happened in Minneapolis. And he said, Sydney, I'm so distraught. What can I do? I said, Jeff, here's what you can do. I want you to be more intentional about creating opportunities for people that don't look like you. Say it one more time. I want you to be more intentional because it just won't happen 
It just doesn't just happen for me. We have to start thinking, how can we advance individuals, women, Hispanics, African-Americans, people that don't look like us? And the, un, the, the and Tim, you hit on the unconscious bias that we all have is okay. When we do our workshops, we like to tell people, of course, you're going to have biases. Of course, you're going to even have stereotypes. You're going to even stereotype people. You're going to group people. But as long as you recognize the bias, as long as you recognize, hey, I'm really stereotyping this individual. And then now we can start changing our mindset. And that's called mindfulness. We're aware of what we're doing. And then we reverse and change our mindset to hopefully in the future be more sensitive to how we process information as we see other individuals that don't look like us. So my challenge to you all is be mindful, be intentional about creating opportunities for individuals that don't live in your same zip code, they're not on your same social media feed, they're not at your church, but they're just like you, they're human beings. I was guilty because I live a life of influence most of my adulthood. I was guilty of, of black privilege. I was guilty of looking at every individual that didn't look like, that looked like me really and saying, why can't they pull themselves out of this mess? And I didn't, I didn't have that sense of empathy that was needed because every situation with every person is different. There's no, there's no one African-American experience. My wife likes to say that. It's not one. It's multiple white experiences. It's multiple experiences being an African-American. It's multiple experiences being women. And it comes down to us showing empathy and how we deal with each person that we encounter and how can we make their lives and people lives around us better. And we can do that. We have the power to do that. And Sydney, we talk about the fact that most of us uh, <laughs> young in our career got sponsored effectively by some boss who wanted to allow us to go to a bunch of advanced, you know, specialty kind of courses when we were growing in our career, and got the green light to do that. And it, a, lot, a lot of it's getting that equal opportunity for, for women and for African Americans and Latinos, and you know, Marshall Lee, just you know, helping get them early on into some programs like we were. Right? You know, those you know, a lot of our uh, Caucasian men had someone who said, "This person's going to be good. Let's help them get further," and and that meant a lot to, to all of us. And that could impact anybody, right? It really does. I, I like to say, I like to say we should we should we don't have to, but it would be nice if we created experiences that will enhance the lives of others. Because I look back when I was in junior high school, I well actually it started when I was in elementary school. I had a scout master, Dave Schaefer, Dave Schaefer. I lived in the East Little Rock projects. Dave Schaefer, white guy from Boston, Massachusetts, decided to volunteer to be a scout master in an all African American project at the Salvation Army. Never forget as long as I live. And those experiences that I gained from being in the Cub Scout, We Below, in the Boy Scout are invaluable. They would have never happened without Dave Schaefer. Coach mm -hmm. Charles Ripley, a white, a white male coach at Hall High School, created experiences for me when I was in high school that I would have never had otherwise. And it helped me to understand the world is bigger than Little Rock, Arkansas, the state of Arkansas. Because Ripley would take us to pro basketball games in Memphis, pro football games in Dallas, college games in Oklahoma. He and, and, created and experiences some, for us. And you got into some pickup games and realized you could play with them, right? Well, I knew Tim I could play with them. Okay. <laughs> I just so, I, I wanted I wanted them to know I could play with them. I knew that. <laughs> but but it, it did Go ahead. Yeah. It did it did it did create some really good experiences for me Games that I would not have otherwise had. Yeah. Yeah. Coach Ripley. Okay. Coach Ripley. So and it's all about experiences that we create to expose young people. 
the things that they had not been exposed to. Because I'm telling you right now, contrary to what you see on TV, I can tell you this, most African-American kids, 85%, 90% of them are just good, hardworking kids. Yeah, yeah, they might wear a hoodie. Yeah, their pants might sag a little bit. But they're good, solid kids that want an opportunity to do great things in their life. They just need that one additional push, one additional uh, support system to help them live a quality life. And then they'll, they'll, and they'll pass it on, just like I'm trying to pass it on. Yeah. So yeah. I know you guys are doing a lot. I, I encourage you just to keep doing as much as you can in that area. In your book, you want to talk about your book? Yeah, I have a copy of this book right here in front of me because I'm going to give it to someone today. I have a meeting, two meetings today on, like I told you, how can we increase the state, University of Arkansas, and more in particular today, how can we get the University of Arkansas, University of Arkansas system, university system, to do more business with African American and women? And so I have a book I'm going to give someone. It's called The Grit Factor in Embracing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. It's my latest book. And the, the sub subtitle is Taking Ownership and Making Our World a Better Place. And I caution us, let's, let's try not to feel like we can't be engaged or we're going to let things just happen because we can play a role in making this place better. And this book is written along the lines of using your ability to build relationships with others, using emotional intelligence, using mindfulness to increase diversity and inclusion by, by uh, building relationships with different people. And it's, it's been well received, it has great illustrations. We have activities at the end of each chapter. We have short takeaways and it's my kind of book. It's not, a, it's not too much, too, too many words, but <laughs> it's just enough words to keep you engaged and, and keep you thinking. Yeah, good. Hey, uh, there's a, you've got a lot of good people who could ask probably some pretty good questions on the call here. Ross Duvall, Jody Gilday, or, or make some point, uh, or, you know, or Patty, uh, any of you. Who would like to ask any questions or make comments to Sydney? Uh, Tim, I'm glad to go. It's Ross. You bet, Ross. Yeah. First of all, Sydney, thank you so much for doing this. I personally feel we need to hear from people like you to help bring us closer together because most people want to address this, this challenge head on. One of my challenges has been, and I'll, I'll explain it to you, and I feel somewhat um, unsuccessful in this. I, I hire a lot of PhD economists in my career and working in a think tank environment. And I've hired a lot of women. I've hired a lot of minorities. But I have never hired a PhD black American. And, and I have tried with recruiters to find the right people. So we're getting to the, I guess my question becomes, you think about legacies of discrimination. There is such a small candidate pool of economists with PhDs, black Americans, that it's a real challenge to find the right candidates. And so I guess my question is, how, how far should I lean into that? In other words, I don't want to hire someone who thinks that they wouldn't have been hired otherwise. I want to hire someone who feels this is something I can do and here's my opportunity. Thank you. Oh, that, that, uh, that's a tremendous question. It is. And sometimes, sometimes we overstretch and we make mistakes by overstretching. Here's what I would here's what I would ask you to consider. How many students in the university system that maybe are not PhD students, but they deal in the same sector that you're talking about, and maybe not don't have any aspirations to be a, to have a PhD, but with your mentorship could become better where they are. You just start earlier, Sydney. Yeah, just start earlier, and they might not even end up being the person that you hire. But right. you have enriched someone's life. You have given them tools that other people won't have, and you have 
and you have effectively made this world better. Yeah, I think of one example, Sydney. I did hire an intern last summer at Heartland Forward uh, who was going into his senior year at the University of Arkansas. Um, he, he was a, a black young man in the marching band, just a great kid. And he was actually in the engineering program, but he had such strong programming skills, technical skills, and we were working on a very technical project that I hired him as an intern, even though he didn't have uh, any expertise in the field of economics. And I guess to some extent I had some impact because I counseled him, I said, stay in school, go ahead, at least get your master's degree in engineering or another field. And he indeed is still, he's at the university. So I guess in some sense I've, I've had an impact, but I would like to take someone under my wing and nurture them a bit, a bit longer than that. Anyhow, I appreciate your time, Sydney, and advice. Well, you know what, Ross, but that's a start. And I was, I was telling someone, impact can look a lot of different ways. Sometimes we look at mentorship as long-term, and I'm not saying it's not long-term. However, if we look back upon, upon our lives, we can, lives, we can think of so many times where a person spent an hour with us or 30 minutes with us or 15 minutes with us. And they said something very impactful that we, that soaked into our system that made us better. Yep. And so you made, you made more of an impact for that young man in that short period of time than most people will probably make with being a mentor long-term. So don't, don't, uh, don't minimize what you've done and just keep doing it. Keep being Thank intentional you, about what you're doing. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, I got to spend a lot of time with Daryl Francis, as you remember, Ross, a great, a great economist in his own right and a, and a chairman of our bank and, and had called all those right interest rates back when we had high inflation. And, you know, I couldn't get on his level, but I sure have used all his wisdom a lot of years, you know, and, and I appreciate what you do, you know, because of him, if you think about it, you know, just understanding the whole macro picture and, um, if anybody hasn't seen Ross's, uh, uh, Ross was on recently and it's on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash CEO forums. And, uh, I, we thought it was great. I think you will too. He gives us a lot of insight into the future, how we need more companies like Stan Zalowski's, uh, popping around here. Uh, the young firm, as I think you referred it to anyway, other questions, Jody or, or Kathy or. And, and Tim, here's what I hear. So here's what I hear. I want everyone on this call to understand this. I do a lot of reading on diversity, equity, inclusion. And one thing I hear a lot of, one thing I've read a lot is people are afraid to talk about this issue because everything they say could be wrong. And rightfully so. Everything you say could be misconstrued. So, so I, I, I understand that. But but we still have to what talk about it. If you have things that you're you don't quite understand, no one is going to label you anything in this conversation. Yeah. Other than well, someone that wants to know and wants to learn. The other thing about it is every time we embrace diversity and get to know someone that's lived a different life from a different world, a different environment, we grow and it's a beautiful thing. I just think that's the the real. Uh, the gift, you know, it just makes it a richer life for you, you know, it, it just be. And also, and, and also we're not, we're not aliens. We're not from a different planet. African-American people are not, we're not aliens. We're, we're, we're human. Just like you, like all people, we're humans. Mm -hmm. I think Tim, what you're saying is once you get to embrace someone that doesn't look like you, you find a humanity that's, that's inside of mm -hmm. that individual mm -hmm. outside of the stereotypes that you, we might see on TV. And I encourage my African-American friends, you all need to get to know white people better because mm -hmm. you all have been stereotypes also. You've been stereotyped. Mm -hmm. And they, I tell them, I said, you have to understand the humanity that's present. Mm -hmm. If we don't understand that, that we're human, then we're going to always be looking at each other sideways. And, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. So well said. Well said. Okay, you can get your book. Tim, what's what's I the? I do uh, have a question. Yes, Joe. Um, I'm still formulating it, so I apologize in advance if I stumble around. Um, I haven't articulated it in my mind. But Sydney, I lead a group of women, or I, I should say, I facilitate a group of women 
Um, recently, two black women have joined our group. I'm thrilled about that. I have been very intentional in, in creating this group organically um, to avoid any appearance and, and the reality of tokenism or just to be diverse for diversity's sake. So I'll say that first. Um, immediately after the first meeting, a new woman to the, club, to the group approached me and said, I have an idea and I'd like to approach this topic of racial inequity and the, and the injustices because so often white women and maybe even particularly white women in the South are somewhat oblivious to systemic racism, don't even have a comprehension of that. What I'm struggling with is um, there is a there is a sense that it's a, become a burden to black people to educate their white friends about these issues. I don't want to place it on this woman to lead the group. I'm happy to lead the group um, in this discussion. I don't feel that I am equipped, but it's going to be just a group of friends talking about this issue. So I guess my, my question is, how do I delicately, um, um, I don't want to place the burden on her. You know, I'm hearing that black women feel like I don't want to be your black, um, what's the word, um, the Siri or your black Alexa that has to uh, inform yep, yeah, you about yeah, yeah. racism. Huh. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't that, even know that, if my question makes prevalent. sense. No, it makes a lot of sense because a number of people do not want to take on that responsibility. However, as many people do want to take on that responsibility. So my advice to you would be to have a, have a very uh, transparent conversation with the individuals and say, here's what I'm looking to do and how do you feel about it? And they will pretty much tell you and maybe do a co-hosting type arrangement to where they don't feel like they're the only voice on this issue. Uh, but I think the best way to handle that is to address it with the individuals because some people do want, uh, some people do want to help individuals understand better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I guess because that, she brought the issue to my attention, she does have some level of interest in, in helping to facilitate that. And I know she's done it in the past. I, I just am trying to be sensitive to that issue that not all black people want to be black Alexa. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. that's so that's so true. And I, I commend you on that. But like I said, as many people that don't do, so just kind of find out where she might she might fit in that in that category. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I bet you the way you facilitate things that everyone would value how you brought it forward. You know, just keep your heart ahead of your brain. You know, <laughs> mainly a lot of times. All right, there's only one person on this call that I see that probably has had. Uh, gone so far to help diversity, inclusion, and, and, and equity that I've got mentioned in Tom Robb, Ku Klux Klan's uh, 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 sermon, and that would be my sister who stood up for it strongly. Hi, Patty, yeah, you, have you got anything to say? You haven't lived until you've been uh, preached about by the Klan. It's, it's pretty yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah. I would just say um, the 20 years that we've been doing the work in Harrison is um, has been wonderful, fulfilling, and frustrating, you know, at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but what we have done is we've, we've had lots of good, long conversations with our African-American friends, with um, our Hispanic, Latino, all of our, you know, the people in our community. And what we have decided is it's almost, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation a lot of times. And many times if we can just sit down with somebody and have that conversation and share our heart with them. They understand, you know, where our heart is and, and uh, where the heart of the most of the community is. We have racists in Harrison. We know that everybody has racists in their communities, um, but we've been very vocal and and uh, one of the main things is uh, cultural competency that we talk about a lot lately is understanding other cultures. And that helps you have that empathy and and uh, just the, the knowledge to be able to speak uh, to two people and and four people, et cetera. So um, that that's something I've learned. I mean, I've said the wrong thing many times, and sometimes very ignorantly made comments that I didn't even realize had any kind of a racial 
connotation, but you still got to talk. You still got to have those conversations and you got to learn from them and be willing to say, I had no idea and I'll never use that again. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Nice contribution. Patty used to run the chamber over there and fought all the hard battles for 10 years. <laughs> Some wonderful people there. But Yeah, great. Yes, that's very good insight. Culturally, we have to, we do have to, and when our workshops, we, we have activities, we have one activity in particular that we challenge people to understand culturally how people are different. And even sometimes we leave out the white uh, group and we want, we have to understand that also. We have to understand mm -hmm. every, not just African-American or Asian or Hispanic. Uh, it's every, we have to understand it and we have to, we have to embrace it and we have to support it to the best of our ability. And we will always say things that are not politically correct sometimes in this, <laughs> in this diversity, <laughs> equity and inclusion world. That's just the reality. We can't always be politically correct, but say what's on your mind. And if someone is there, they're gonna, with the, with, the, with the love, with love in their heart, they're gonna maybe give you some tidbits that can help you later where, like you said, Patty, you won't say those things any, any longer, but if we, if we remain quiet, then that's not a benefit to anyone, I don't think. Well, and I'd rather, I'd rather have someone make a mistake. I'd yeah. rather have someone make a mistake saying something than not saying something. Absolutely, and your comment yeah. about everybody's experience is different, you know, uh, mm -hmm. keeping that in mind that some people have had, you know, bad experiences in their past or were raised differently than I was, Tim and I were, you know, and so, you know, we, we didn't hear some things growing up as other people have, et cetera. So understanding that everybody's different and everybody in, and in every a, culture is different. Absolutely. And there's a, that's such a huge uh, African-American affluent group of African-Americans throughout our country that everyone doesn't live in poverty. It's not a poverty issue with, uh, with a number of people. And I remember I had a conversation with my son. We were talking about being stopped by their be on policemen. I have four sons. And we were not having a conversation. We were having it along with some other individuals. And every one of my sons, they said, oh, I never had a bad experience with the policeman. <laughs> All right. Which would be totally different than someone that's maybe not affluent, that live in an edgier neighborhood, that police take a more aggressive approach to because they feel crime is higher there and they don't use all their trainers they should use. But my sons had no reservation. Oh, but also they, they know how to communicate very well. That's another thing. They know what to do, what to say, what not to say. Uh, and they would not, there would be a, a whole lot of kids like my kids throughout this country. And so every, every, there's no one experience for any ethnicity well, uh, you know, Sydney, you're a great example of what's possible. Uh, I, I was with Sydney inviting me to go over to Stan, he, Stan what was the coach's name? Heath, uh, when he was going to address the team on how to become a championship, championship caliber athlete. He was talking about how he got, how he did that. And, uh, and he said, I grew up. And then he said, he stopped. He said, well, let's just say I grew up hard. So I called Coach Foster after that. I said, tell me more about how Sydney grew up, you know. And I delve into that, and uh, he, we, were, we were fortunate he weaved his way through and, and broke through because he's a, one of the finest human beings we know and, and uh, has been really, you know, probably millions of dollars worth of advertising for the goodwill to Arkansas as he represented us being the kind of person he is as a great uh, pro athlete. And, uh, it, you know, Don Nelson, we almost played a little two-minute clip for you where Don Nelson says before Michael Jordan showed up, that uh, Sydney was the best all-around guard in the NBA, and uh, and that was pretty evident there for two, three years. And we even with a bad knee, and he represented our state well. And we got all got to be grateful for that. We, his voice is important, so everybody, he's open, he's available for workshops and books, and uh, see if you can't get him engaged in in some organization that you know that might be interested in it. He's a fine man, and um, and we'd like to see his firm uh, do well because his voice is important. He's just an all-around good person, great person to support. And, and you guys, please consider, well, please consider going to sydneymoncrief.com and purchasing a book for yourself, for your group. It's, a, it's an excellent read. I'm delivering, I'm in my car right now, I have 10 books for one group and I think 12 books for another group. They bought, and they bought them for friends. 
and associates and people that work within their firm because I think every angle that we can get on this subject is vital. And see, my book is not just about, my book is about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but it's really about becoming a better me because yeah. emotional intelligence has, emotional intelligence has no, it's, it's, it's colorblind. Mindfulness is colorblind. How to deal with your emotions, that's colorblind. And I did the book that way intentionally because I wanted, and Patty, you said it, I wanted to put the focus on becoming a better me so I can build relationships with others one-on-one -on -one because this battle is a one-on-one -on -one battle. It's really not a group battle. We have to do it person by person. So I encourage you, sydneymoncrief.com, buy the book. You won't be disappointed. And we're gonna we're gonna win this battle.